and welcome back to Explore with NTV. I'm Nadira and I hope that you are all well and are ready to explore a new educational topic. And so Tusby is going to be explaining what today's topic is for this episode. Hello friends, like Nadira said, I'm going to be explaining what the topic is about. The topic is called vaccines and we're of course going to be talking about vaccines and why are they so important. Yeah, and I think especially with today and how the fact that we are living through a pandemic, a global pandemic, it's yeah. really important to understand how vaccines work, how they were invented, their history, and all the things related to vaccinology, the study of vaccines. Yeah. Yes. And so, since we ha obviously are going to be talking about vaccines amongst us, I also want to hear Flora's opinion. Hi, Flora. Hi everyone! <laughs> How are you Flora? I'm great! So Flora, are you excited to learn about vaccines and their history? Yes, sounds very informative. <laughs> and if you had to take a vaccine, would you? Yes, I want to be safe. Hmm. Flora, do you know who develops medicines and vaccines? Yes, scientists and researchers. What, do, what does a vaccine look like? It looks like a kind of needle. That's what I would say. Yeah. Have you had a vaccine? Have you had a vaccine? Um, yes, I have, but it was very painful and my arm still hurts. Oh, but obviously, even if you are scared of vaccines or the needles, it's still important to uh, take them to support your wider community. Yeah. Mm. So thank you, Flora. I found those questions and your answers very, very informative. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Flora. Bye. <laughs> so, um, Tasbi, what about you? Have, have do you know anyone or your family that have taken the vaccine? Yes, my parents and my grandparents have. Oh wow. Um, what about you, Nadira? My grandma has taken the vaccine, and I know a lot of my friends' grandparents have also taken the vaccine, so I feel like that does prove how the government is doing a great job at spreading the vaccine and helping the most vulnerable people. Yeah, it's very important yeah. to stay safe and stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, what has been your experience of the previous lockdowns, and how have you been managing them? Well, um, schools have been closed, yeah. so I've been doing online school mm. and what I like to do when I have free time, of course I'd have lots of free time yeah. in previous lockdowns, I would do art oh. and read books. What type of art would you do? Well, we've done lots of things in my school. Mm in my old school, like draw pictures of me and my family and Aww. maybe copy some pictures. Oh, okay, that's really cool. And so with m my experience of lockdown, I would say a very similar thing. Definitely I do have a lot more free time, but obviously with university uh, being online, it's very difficult, especially since I'm in my first year. I've actually never gone to a university lecture before. Wow. Yeah, so it's crazy. And because of that, it means that, you know, studying on, online is harder because I've never experienced university level education before. Actually, because of that, my university decided that the whole of first year doesn't count towards my final degree grade. Oh, wow. So I guess that does kind of prove that lockdown has impacted lots of people and students have been complaining about the fact that they're worried that their results won't reflect how they could have actually performed if they was in person, you know? Yeah, and I moved mm. to a new school and I'm in my first year group oh, in there. So it must so have been quite difficult to, you know, meet people and yeah. it's a new school. Yeah. Yeah, because there's new things that I have to get used to and mm. some of the things can't happen yeah. because it's online. Mm. And I think a lot of people share our experiences as well. Yeah. So how could you protect your family and make sure that they stay safe during this pandemic? Well, of obviously stay home yeah. and I think it's the most important thing. Yeah and the times that you uh, you do have to go out it's important to definitely wear a mask especially on public transport there's so many different people on public transport so it's important for you uh, to keep your distance social distance two meters apart and wear a mask. Yeah. Mm. How about you Nadira? 
So again, I would say the same thing with, I always try to wear my mask, even if it's not on public transport. Um, I think it's just important to always have it on you. I keep it with my keys and my phone so that I always remember it. Uh. So yeah. And uh, why would you say that you trust the COVID vaccine? Because there's been other vaccines mm. that have worked. Yeah. So that's why um, I trust it mm. and because they're getting better and better and better every yeah. time yeah. but we don't want lots of viruses yeah <laughs> I would say a similar thing actually before there used to be apothecaries and what? loads of people used to think that you know obviously science was less developed then and so people used to trust these and like magical places to heal them but actually they didn't ever work you know apothecaries are nowhere nearly as effective as actual GPs and hospitals that provide vaccines. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, what was the last vaccine that you had and what was it for? Well, it was for a flu job. Oh, okay. I normally get a flu every year. Mm. And so when do you normally take it? Um, a few days or a few weeks mm. before. Before uh, winter? Yeah, before autumn or winter. Oh, okay. I normally have it around that time. Yeah. I would say the last vaccine that I took was probably, I mean, I probably have taken more, but I just forgot them. But I think one of them that I, I really remember well is the HPV virus. Uh, that vaccine that was taken in uh, year nine, so I was 14 years old. My whole secondary school had to take that particular vaccine. Oh, yeah. wow. So like everyone yeah. in my year group. In school, mm. And with my flu jab, mm. I normally do it with my friends. At oh, school. okay, yeah. yeah. So actually, a lot of the time, primary schools and secondary schools both provide vaccines for all their students just to make sure that everyone gets it. It's yeah. really important. And now, since we obviously had shared our personal experiences of vaccines and our thoughts, let's talk a little bit about some of the previous pandemics and plagues. So do you remember when the Black Death had happened? Well, yes, it was in the 14th century mm. and kind of the 13th too. Yeah. Um, so 1346 to 1353. Wow, so that was a very long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it mm. was. How did it spread? So it actually spread through mice and it, they were all on these ships and the ships came across Europe. Obviously, ships, they sail to loads of different places. And so from Asia, it came to Europe. And the, the mice actually had it from mosquitoes that would bite them. So that's often how you know, viruses spread through animals. And actually, they did a terrible job at maintaining you know, uh, the virus in one particular mm. area. They were very bad. They would pile all the dead bodies together, and they would not, like, um, dispose of them properly and things like that and as a result they didn't actually you know uh, stay safe they, loads of more people died unnecessarily because of lack of education about viruses of you know it was in the past people didn't know much about them yeah. but they did actually know enough to think that wearing masks was useful like for instance in the black death specifically they wore beaked masks and that was often you know a very iconic look uh, during that time period yeah I did one like for props mm. in a school play for the great plague yeah and i i wore a mask oh. that had the beat so you have yeah. you're familiar with it yeah, yeah. it's very hard to breathe so yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> and so other than the black death do you know any other uh, examples of diseases that have been uh, vaccinated uh, yes like the Ebola. Yeah, the Ebola virus, yeah, that's a good example. Is there any other ones? Um, well, the Spanish flu is a yeah, good Yeah, the one. Spanish flu was very, very uh, dangerous and it killed lots of, lots of, lots of people. Yeah. Mm. Who made the first medicinal vaccine? So the founder of vaccines was actually a person called Edward Jenner. Oh. And he was American, and he actually created the first ever vaccine for this boy. He was 12 years old, and he had cowpox. And uh -huh. so he cured um, 
his disease and it made him uh, get better. And that's actually why he's considered the founding father of vaccinology, because he created the first ever vaccine. Uh. Mm. He later then created the vaccine for smallpox, and that was very revolutionary. Smallpox was a disease that was around since the 11th century, and he was born in the 18th century, so that's been around for a really long time, and he was actually able to cure it, which was really good. Yeah. Mm. And so, other than like COVID, what other diseases do you know that spread from animals? Well, like the Great Plague. Yeah. Or chicken pox? Oh yeah, chicken pox is very common now, but we don't actually think of it as a disease, but it is technically. Yeah, and like, like chicken pox mm. and mad cow. Oh yeah. Some, um, some diseases that came from animals mm. are named after animals. Yeah, so. and actually the the concept of an animal passing on a virus is called zoonosis. And yeah. kind of like you know, zoo. Yeah, with the zoo, you can tell that it's uh, about animals, and that's passing on a disease from another animal to a, a human. So yeah. And what are vi viruses exactly? So viruses are actually considered non-living organisms, which is very interesting. Even though they reproduce, um, they aren't actually. They're very different from the evolutionary category that we consider all other organisms, bacteria, and animals. So they're very unique. Mm -hmm. And do you know what the life cycle is of a virus? Like how do they reproduce? Well, so they kind of take over cells. Yeah. And that's how they make more viruses. Mm. And because of the fact that they, don't act, they can't actually reproduce by themselves, like how you said, they take over the cell, that's why they're considered non-living, because they can't live without another host. Yeah. Mm. And other than that, do you know uh, uh, more about like how viruses are, um, how they are classified? Like, like the fact that we were talking about viruses are very distinct from like bacteria, for instance, you know? Yes. So yeah, that's another important thing that viruses aren't bacteria. They are a very separate type of category. Yeah. Bacteria is like on a lower level. Yeah, the and yeah. viruses are higher level, mm. like coronavirus. Mm. And so that's all that we have for, for this, this segment. And so see you after the break. Bye. Bye. Hello, friends, and welcome back after the break. In this segment of the episode, we normally read books, so that's what we're going to do. So, Tuspy, what would you like to read? Well, I'd like to read this book, well, okay. a part of it, but mm. first I want to read a piece of writing that I wrote. Okay, let's hear it. It is actually from that book, oh. but I'm, it's not actually from that book, it's like... Your uh, own version. A job. Oh, I see. Thing. The perfect grandma, because George's grandma... Oh, the this George from the book. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. not. she's not nice. So. Are you kind, caring and helpful? Then you are perfect for the job. The ideal grandma must be kind at all times, be able to tell brilliant bedtime stories, be able to patch up Gray's knees, take grandchildren out on exciting days. Then you are the right person. To apply... Please call 020-5026-9233. I made that number up. Oh. So, or go to our website, www.greatgrannies.com to download an application form. <laughs> I also made that up too. Oh. You will be provided with one obedient child, a first aid kit, and and an apron. Mm. Ghastly old grandmothers need do not apply. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to read my book. I really book. like that. Yeah. Thing that you were always so <laughs> great and funny. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to read my part. Of, mm. I didn't make it, but a part of George's marvelous medicine. Mm -hmm. George begins to make the medicine. 
George took an enormous saucepan out of the cupboard and placed it on the kitchen table. George came the thrill voice from next from the next room. What are you doing? Nothing, Grandma. He called out. You didn't think I can't hear you? Just because you closed the door, you're rattling the saucepans. I'm just tidying the kitchen, Grandma. Then there was silence. George had absolutely no doubts whatsoever about how he was going to make his famous medicine. He wasn't going to fool about wondering whether to put in a little bit of this or a little bit of that. Quite simply, he was going to put in everything he could find. There would be no messing about, no hesitating, no wondering whether a particular thing would knock the old girl sideways or not. <laughs> the rule would be this. Whatever he saw, if it was runny or powdery or gooey, it went in. Wow. Um, nobody ever had made a medicine like that before. If, you, if it didn't, actually cure grandma then it would be anyway cause some exciting results it would be worth watching um, uh, various rooms one at a time and see what they had to offer he would go first to the bathroom there are always lots of funny things in the bathroom so upstairs he went carrying the enormous two handled saucepans before him. In the bathroom, he gazed longingly at the famous and dreaded machine cupboard, but he didn't go near it. It was the only thing in the entire house he was forbidden to touch. He had made a solemn oath promises to his parents about this, and he wasn't going to break them. There were things in there he had told them um, his parents told him that could actually kill a person. Wow. Um, a p all, and although he was going to give Grandma a pretty fierce, fiery mouthful, he didn't really want a dead body on his hands. <laughs> George put the saucepan on the floor and went to work. Number one was a bottle labelled Golden Gloss Hair Shampoo. He emptied it into the pan that ought to wash her tummy nice and clean he said he took a full tube of toothpaste and squeezed out the whole lot of it in one long worm maybe that will brighten up those horrid brown teeth of hers he said there was an aerosol can of super foam shaving soap belonging to his father. George loved playing with arrows. He pressed the button and kept his finger on it until there was nothing left. A wonderful mountain of white foam built up in the giant saucepan. With his fingers, he scooped out the contents of a jar of vitamin entered face cream. Wow. In went a small bottle of scarlet nail varnish. If the toothpaste doesn't clean her teeth, George said, then this paint will make them red as roses. He found another jar of creamy stuff labeled hair remover. Smear it off your legs, it said and allow it to remain for five minutes. George tipped it all into the saucepan. There was a bottle with yellow stuff inside it called This was a famous dandruff cure. It went in. There was something called Brilliant for cleaning false teeth. It was white powder. It in that went too. He found another aerosol can Never more poking desert spray, guaranteed, it said, to keep away unpleasant 
body smells for a whole day. She could use plenty of that, George said as he sprayed the entire can full into the saucepan. Liquid paraffin. The next one was called. It was a big bottle. He hadn't the faintest idea what it did to you, but he poured it in anyway. That, he thought, looking around him, was about all from the bathroom on his mother's dressing table in the bedroom. George found yet another lovely aerosol can. It was called Helga Harrison holds 12 inches away from the hair and spray lightly. He squirted the whole lot into the sauce pack. He did enjoy squirting these aerosols. There was a bottle of perfume called Flowers of Turnips. It smelled of old cheese. It went in and in. Two went a large round box of powder. It was called pink plaster. There was a power puff on top and he threw it that yeah. in for luck as well. He found a couple of lipsticks. He pulled greasy red things out of their little cases and added them to the mixture. So that's a part of George's marvelous. Well, that was a long section of yeah. of that book. Yeah. Um, and so I would like to read my book, which is called Wizardology. Oh. And the reason why I would like to read it is because of the fact that um, a lot of people in the past, before modern medicine, would rely on things like magic, potentially, to cure them. And so actually what I want to show here today is this section of the book. So this is a wizard's workshop. And actually it's quite funny because I'd much rather trust scientists in a lab than wizards in their workshop to create a vaccine or to help me. And so it says here that there's a library, wardrobe, crystal ball, skull, uh, and some ingredients that you need, as well as a fireplace in order to create a wizard's workshop. Uh, so, do you want to show it? Um, well, I already did. Um, the letter. Oh, yes, yeah. you can. There's a little letter box here. It's very interactive. Yeah. And you can see multiple of these going past. So, yeah. And book. A book. A book. Okay, so let's read the next segment that I want. It is called Potions, Healing and Magical Transformations. Just as we have seen that the flying ornaments are most often the creations of duplicious uh, tolerance, many other potions have little ways of making magical effects apart from uh, endangered vomiting. Yet genuine potions, rather than those sold on the roadside by mountain banks, are very efficient in causing wizardological changes. However, the art of making potions requires extraordinary care and skill, two qualities which usually are lacking in the most common apprentice. So this is quite a funny uh, page, just talking about how potions were made by wizards to heal other people, and sometimes people did that wrong, and so they became a donkey. donkey. Like, uh, it's quite funny. Um, like Pinocchio. Yeah. And so there are multiple potions, which is called the love for light, the healing draught. So when I'm mentioning the fact that wizards were often associated to create potions, that's what I'm referring to in terms of healing, the wisdom potion and the future seeing ornament. And so the final section that I would want to read is this part. And this is, ki it kind of does look like a lab. But actually, of course, a lot of wizardological um, labs and um, workshops were not very effective uh, because obviously it's, it's quite nonsense. You would trust science much more than you would trust uh, a wizard. So let's read some. Unfortunately, modern apprentices are apt to get tempered away from science, from serious business of wiz wizardology too easily. They are attracted to the glamour of scientific discoveries and abandon the more rigorous pursuit of magic, leaving their masters in despair. 
While science is an adequate and adequate study of the simple-minded, the intelligent apprentice would much better avoid all these horrendous ideas and foolish notions. So it's actually quite funny. This book is referring to the fact that science is incorrect, which is not true. And the yeah. fact is, is that actually this magical nonsense is what is incorrect. Um, yeah, so there maybe they were trying to prove that. Yeah, but of course now this was in the past. We have much more modern uh, ideas of testing things, and that's much more reliable than creating potions. So. Alchemy is a section of um, science and it inter intersects with wizardology, so I'll be reading a section about that. Alchemy involves studying natural materials to try and discover two main things, the elixir of life, a tonic uh, that supposedly gives perfect health and prevents aging of the body, and the philosopher's stone, a material that mixed with lead uh, is supposed to leach out impurities and produce gold. Alchemists do not realize that the gold and lead are both elements and that they cannot simply turn into one another. The apprentice will know and the magical methods of turning lead into gold are another matter entirely. Now this is actually completely false because we know the fact that the majority of elements are made in the sun. And um, so again, this idea that lots of things in the past people were actually incorrect in believing. Um, so the next part is about astrology and astronomy. There are two branches of science uh, of the planets. The first, astrology, describes the magical effects of the positions of the stars and planets have on the, uh, and their events. The second is astronomy, which deals with stars and planets of the physical objects in the sky. This is an interesting, but it is little practical use. The Greek Aristotle taught that the sun revolves around the earth. Now, thanks to observations of Copernicus, even non-wizards know that the earth revolves around the sun. So this is an interesting book. It just highlights the fact that people in the past used to believe in magic as a way of healing, when in actuality now we have modern medicine to help us. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope that you enjoyed this segment uh, and uh, got a big insight about some of the different types of things that people used to believe in uh, from the books that we've read. So we'll see you after the break. Bye. Bye. Hi everyone and welcome back uh, from the break and so today we have a guest with us and her name is Nathashi. So hi Nathashi. Hi there. How are you? I'm good and you? I'm fine and so we'd love to get to know you a bit better and we have a few questions to ask you. Yeah. So Nathashi, how old are you and what do you study? Uh, currently I'm 19 and I'm studying biomedical sciences. Ooh. Um, what's the best thing about your subject? Uh, it sparks my curiosity a lot. There's always um, something new to learn. And uh, so what motivated you to choose that particular subject for your degree? There's like a broad spectrum of jobs to look from afterwards. Plus, I want to go into medicine after, so this is like a good pathway to get into medicine as well. Ah, okay. Um, and... Uh, who would you say most supported you throughout your studies? Uh, my mentor, she was someone I recently met in year 13 who's guided me throughout my academic year in college and is now my well-wisher throughout university as well. Mm. Which university did you study at? Um, currently I'm studying at Middlesex. Mm. And you're in your first year, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, how have you been dealing with lockdown? You're obviously just like me in your first year of university. How has that experience of online learning been for you? It's something completely different, of course, to what we're used to. But I feel like we're in a computer world anyway, so it's a unique way of learning. Mm. And has it been difficult for you? At times, yeah, especially when you're like trying to get hold of lecturers. If it's yeah. in real life, you can just like run to their room. Now it's just like, I'll email you and wait for like three days. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit there, but other than that, you, you're still connected to people, mm -hmm. even though it's virtual. Yeah. And what job role would you want in the future? Uh, I'm aiming to go for cardiology, which is like a heart doctor. Oh, okay. So let's see how that goes. Mm. And how have you been supporting your loved ones during the pandemic and lockdown? 
Well, we've got a lot of time on our hands right now, so I'm just trying to spend more time with my family, you know, just talking to them, especially knowing that our parents are. So I'm ethnically not, obviously, from here, I'm from Sri Lanka, so mm. I'm just, like, talking back home and learning about the war and everything. So it's nice to spend some time with my family. Yeah, I agree. How have you been dealing with lockdown in your educational life? Um, so as I'm studying a science degree, I kind of wanted to broaden my education around other stuff, sort of maths as well. So I do data analysis on Excel and other sort of online courses. Yeah. It just helps me spend my time as well as improve my education as well. Mm. Yes. Yeah, it's a really good way of staying productive. Yeah. yeah. What is important, why is it important to trust their GPs and doctors? Uh, so GPs and doctors spend years and years getting to their qualification to where they are. So they know what they are doing. Mm. And when patients start to trust their doctors, they would start to uh, tell them about personal and non-medical information, which makes it easier for the doctors to tailor the sort of treatments that their patient needs and it just makes the whole process a lot easier. Hmm. Yeah. So thank you so much Natasha. I really enjoyed your answers and I feel like I do get, uh, know you a bit better. But since yeah. today's episode is about vaccines, we'd like to get your opinion and your expertise on the matter. Yeah. So do you know how exactly vaccines work? Uh, so put it, put it out simply, the actual injection has a weakened or dead version of the bacteria and virus. Mm. And so when we get injected, our body produces antibodies. And what these antibodies do is they fight this uh, weakened version of the virus. And yeah. this then creates a memory of the action plan. And so in the future, if we were to get that exact same virus or bacteria, then the body already knows, oh, I've seen this. And so it will fight that specific bacterial virus at a quicker rate. Hmm. Why is it important to take the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, so we've seen how with uh, the cases rising right now, we really needed the vaccination to bring down the number of cases uh, because this the number of cases is causing a lot more deaths as well. So the vaccination is going to be another prevention method alongside quarantine and masks and it should hopefully bring us in a bit better situation and so how do we encourage communities that are a bit more skeptical of the vaccine and how they work how should we encourage them to trust the vaccine uh, i think the main problem comes in with the fact that not everyone knows how a vaccine works or why we take it and so there should be more uh, sort of online i mean currently right now we're only going to do online uh, videos and podcasts or whatever but just spread awareness to the population mm. and preach out that this is why doctors and scientists have made the vaccine and this is how important they are mm. and once you start publicly teaching everyone there's a better chance for them to understand that okay this is why they are like okay take them and they're really on like convincing people mm. I agree. I, f I feel like there's a lot of scare uh, about the vaccine and yeah. lots of conspiracies going on online about it. But we should definitely educate uh, people as much as possible on the truth about how vaccines yeah. actually work. Yeah, because they help you mm. in a good way while helping other people. Yeah, exactly. Why do people need to take multiple doses of the vaccine? Uh, so if we take the P Pfizer, which is the first vaccine that came out, what they say is that the first dosage, which uh, usually was we just first started to give in December, that will give you some level of protection from the virus. However, if you want a full protection from the virus, so about 95% efficiency, the second dosage provides this, which is why um, the vaccine is uh, preferred with two dosages rather than one. Ah, okay. Okay. And which people are encouraged to take the vaccine first? Uh, so right now, from data analysis, we've realized that it's people who are above the age of 65 mm. are a lot more vulnerable. So they're considered as the vulnerable population and have been asked to take the vaccines first. Yeah. Will the current vaccine prevent the spread of other current variants? 
That's a that's a tricky question, I'd say, because the new variants become more and more resistant to the vaccine. So I guess we'll have to let time show us if the vaccines are actually working on the new variants as well. And if they are, then we're in luck. If not, because the vaccine's made from mRNA, or it's mRNA-based, it would be a lot easier to modify for the upcoming variants. Mm. And how can the audience find out more information about vaccines and COVID and, and like the virus in general? Uh, so I'd say the most, the best source to use would be the NHS website. Mm. Uh, for kids, there's a website called Kids Kiddle. But if you want to make it really interactive and fun, YouTube, best place to go. Mm. I would also say another important organization is the World Health Organization, so WHO. Their website is very informative about the updates that they have been trying to do and the help and support that they have uh, for different countries across the world. Yeah. Mm. And so, thank you so much for answering our questions. And now, possibly, it's time for our quiz. Yes, yeah, it's time for our quiz. So, we will be asking you multiple choice questions and just you have to try your best to answer them correctly. Yes. yes. And so, th do you want to start, Tusby? Yeah. Which of the following plagues did people wear beaked masks to protect themselves? Black death, bird flu, or Spanish flu? The black death. Mm. That's correct. And actually, the first ever description of the mask was in 1619. Yeah. yeah. And it was suggested that inside the mask, there was actually multiple uh, different fragrances and perfumes. And they were supposedly going to um, disattract all of the uh, viruses and all of the bacteria and stuff. So actually, um, obviously that's not necessarily true, uh, but that's what people used to believe in the past. And so the next question is, which president contracted smallpox a short time before delivering a very famous speech? George Washington? Abraham Lincoln or Grover uh, Clem, Cle Keverland? Politics. Uh, Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> yeah, Abraham Lincoln's correct. And actually, he is obviously uh, one of the most famous US presidents, but a lot of people forget that he had smallpox. So it's quite interesting to see that, um, you know, a lot of people, that yeah. sometimes certain things in history are forgotten. Even though they're famous, they're yeah. forgotten. Of, of, but of course he was hopefully and luckily able to recover from the smallpox just before yeah. fam his famous speeches, so that was really good. The vaccine called Verifert is designed to fight with common illness. With which common illness? Chickenpox, polyufruit, or swine flu? Chickenpox? Mm. Yeah, that's right. And so, again, with chickenpox, we often, you know, we don't really think about chickenpox because it's obviously so um, old in, in the sense that we've had the vaccine for yeah. a very long time, right? Yes, but it's also famous, like April. Yeah, exactly. And so, another question about history. Uh, which famous inventor wished he supported uh, the smallpox uh, uh, verification and eradication after his last son had died earlier that year from that particular disease? Thom Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, or Roger Beacon? Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, that's right. Benjamin Franklin was actually considered one of the founding fathers of the United States, and he unfortunately had his son die from smallpox. Oh, yeah. really sad. When was the World Health Organization formed? Option one, 1948. Option two, 1956. Option three, 1962. 1948. That's correct. Yeah, well that's done. right. Well done so far. And so, uh, which of the following countries uh, had the first was the first fully documented uh, epidemic uh, considered to have occurred with smallpox. Was it China, India, or South Africa? China. Yeah, China's right. Yeah. Um, actually, China was the first ever country. So that was approximately a thousand years ago in the 11th century. 
and then India afterwards, uh, I think approximately at um, the year 1525. And so that was first China, then India, and then actually afterwards was the whooping cough, and that was in France. But that was a much smaller outbreak. It was specifically known for it being in Paris. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk a little bit more about some of the questions. You've done really well, I'm surprised. Yeah, I um, think you've got all of them correct. Yeah, so you, you did really well. And, and so other than like, um, other than like the vaccines in the past, do you know uh, other plagues potentially that have occurred throughout history? Uh, I think before these ones, there was a Spanish flu. Yeah. That was a huge one as well. I mean, we've sort of realized that there's a sort of plague slash pandemic every hundred years mm. occurring. So mm -hmm. that is, I, I, the thing is right now, we're at such a developed world that we, we were able to get vaccines right now. Back in the days, like you mm. said, they had flowers to help them, mm. which to us now sounds like, wow, really? Did you think that? But back in the days, that was their thought process. Like, this is mm. going to help us. Yeah. So, yeah. Science it's developed a lot. Mm. And it's crazy how all of these epidemics and pandemics have happened in history. There's countless examples of previous ones that have happened. So you're right in the sense that it does happen quite frequently, maybe every 100 years. Yeah. Yeah. Like, maybe in this sort of order. <laughs> yeah, they're actually, that's, there's like a timeline. If you can obviously uh, go on the internet and search things about pandemics, you will see from the first ever one in China, uh, with that we had the smallpox till now with coronavirus so it's definitely a huge number of them and so thank you so much Nathashi for all of your contribution for this segment and that's all that we have for this segment so bye see you in the next episode bye, bye.